It's March 1983. Steve Jobs and I have spent five months together almost every weekend. I would fly to California, he'd fly to New York, getting to know one another. And it's a beautiful day in early spring. We've been walking around, and I'd taken him over to the Metropolitan Museum to walk him through the ancient art collection from Greece to see whether he could get absorbed in something he didn't know much about. And he took me over to Tower Records to hear some of the music he was really excited about. And we ended up on the terrace of his new apartment at the San Remo Paris, Palace Hotel. And as we're standing there looking out over the Hudson River, I said, Steve, I've thought about it for a long time. I'd like to help you for free. I'd like to be an advisor, but I'm not coming to Apple. I'm going to stay here at Pepsi. And Steve had his running shoes on and blue jeans and black turtleneck sweaters that we all remember him in. And he's looking down at the ground for about 20 seconds, and he looks up to me, and he had black hair and very black eyes at that time in his life. And he stares at me, and he says, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life? <laughs> or do you want to come with me and change the world? It kind of knocked the wind out of me. But I didn't give him an answer. But a week later, I was working for Apple because I was always wonder for the rest of my life what I might have missed if I didn't do it. And when I showed up at Apple, it looked very different in Silicon Valley than it does today. For example, Silicon Valley was just a lot of tilt-up, one-story buildings, and the Macintosh building had a black and white pirate's flag flying on it, because Steve said, we're the pirates, we're not the Navy. And I remember going in there and seeing robots and uh, all kinds of you know, young people. The average age was 22 uh, in the Mac group. And Bill Gates would come down. I remember the first time I met Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and I were there together in the Mac lab. It was late at night. And we were sitting around talking. Really, Bill and Steve, I was more a witness to this. And I knew that they were kind of adversaries in so many ways because they were competitive. But here's what was interesting. They weren't talking about competition. And I had come from the world of competition. I had been part of the Cola Wars. I mean, competition was what I thought business was about. But here I am sitting there listening to Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, and they're talking about a noble cause. And the noble cause for them was to take the great business visionaries' ideas, Peter Drucker, who said, we're going to someday have an information economy. And he said this back in 1959, and this is 1983. And he said, we're going to have someone called a knowledge worker, and they're going to be able to use knowledge to become more productive. And that was the noble cause that Steve Jobs and Bill Gates had. And they were focused on the idea of changing the world by taking computers, which at that time, for most of us, we thought of these giant machines with spinning disks in air-conditioned glass-walled rooms. And they had this idea that they were going to make a personal computer, and it was going to empower people with a tool for the mind and change the world one person at a time. And that was their noble cause. And I can tell you, in all the meetings that Steve Jobs and, and I had, and with Bill Gates and Steve and I, Never once did anyone ever talk about making money. It was all about changing the world with these two incredible visionaries. A great metaphor in Silicon Valley was inspired by John F. Kennedy back in 1961 when he was speaking to the nation for the first time as president, and he said, before the end of this decade, we are going to put men on the moon, and we're going to return them to Earth safely. And yet, we didn't have any technology to do this, because it was the era of analog technology and the telemetry to get somebody to the moon and get them back, more or less to be 
light weight enough to be able to fit into a rocket ship didn't exist. And during that decade, you know, people came out and had the passion to go and build this technology, took the transistor to become the integrated circuit, which became fundamental to the digital age that we all enjoy today. And so we call that in Silicon Valley, the moonshot. And moonshot is a metaphor. So when Tim Berners-Lee created the World Wide Web, which empowered people to communicate with computers, that was the moonshot, meaning that the world was never again the same after that happened. When Google in 1999 created relevancy ranking and search, which enabled us to search knowledge over the World Wide Web, right after that, the world was never again the same. And in 2007, when Steve Jobs launched the iPhone, the world was never again the same because he was able to give us a mobile device that could connect people to services. It's hard to believe that it's only eight years ago that there was no such thing as an iPhone or a smartphone. So, for me, it's all about connecting the dots. And you can go back to major moonshots that have changed the world. Fire, wheel, printing press. And now the moonshot opportunity is all about data. So you see, data is a unique resource. It's not scarce like water and oil. It's incredible abundance. We're going to have massive amounts of data. And it's learning how to take that data and do things with it in clever ways that's changing everything in our world. Our economy is shifting power from large incumbent organizations to shifting power to consumers, ordinary people like us. Why? Because social media is giving us transparency and giving us the ability to look at the opinions of other people. And we pay more attention to the opinions of other people than we do to the messages of even the most respected incumbent organizations. So let me tell you a little bit what it's like in Silicon Valley. You see, it all starts with people who have this insatiable curiosity. They're curious about everything. And they come to Silicon Valley because they want to be part of something important. Not just to make money, but do something that's important. And so these are mission-driven organizations. And leadership in these organizations, because for the most part, these are startups. And by startups, I mean two, three, four people starting on an idea. And there's never consensus in the leadership of these startup companies because it's about someone leading them who is passionate, who believes that they can do something, and they're able to bring together this incredible talent that comes to Silicon Valley from all over the world. You talk about immigrants uh, being able to uh, work together and culturally assimilate. It's no better example than Silicon Valley. So here's the really interesting insight for me. And I didn't know this before I got there. You see, when you are successful and you're in a world where things are changing all the time, you can easily become a victim of your success. And you can see this over and over again. Some of the most successful companies in the world actually become so successful that they misunderstand why they are still successful. And the real learning that takes place is from the mistakes that you make. It feels really, really painful when you make a mistake, particularly when you make it in public. I've made mistakes, others have made mistakes, and the cool thing about Silicon Valley is that the first thing that someone asks when you make a, a, even a big embarrassing mistake, what did you learn? Because we learn most from our mistakes, and so in Silicon Valley we say, fail fast and fail forward. And then it's about focus. And then it's about focus again. And then it's about focus again. Because big organizations usually aren't good at focusing. You have to focus to survive as a startup company. And you have to have a sense of urgency. And you got to get the good stuff done. So let's go back to the noble cause idea. Because it's such a powerful insight, I believe, and an inspiration for so many people as they think about, what do you want to do with your life? Well, let me give you an example. 
you start with a noble problem. And here's a noble problem. Our U.S. health care system is totally unaffordable. It's 18% of our GDP, $3 trillion a year. We can't afford it. So what do we do about it? Well, let's unpack it. 50% of the population has a chronic disease. Chronic disease is type 2 diabetes, it's congestive heart failure, it's obstructive sleep apnea, it's obesity, it's all of these things that are together adding up to about 75% of the cost of our healthcare system. 75% of that $3 trillion we spend every year on health is for chronic care disease. Now, the backstory is that the healthcare system missed the PC revolution. It also happened to miss the internet revolution. It sure can't afford to lose the data revolution. So now let's take the noble problem and think about it in the context of a noble cause. Well, smart data can save lives and it can save money. And let me give an example. Most of those chronic care diseases are actually preventable. If you could get the population to lose 20 pounds, you dramatically would change uh, the cost of health care. The cost of health care uh, is, is tied to the fact that there are high comorbidities, meaning high correlation between these different chronic care diseases. So if you happen to be obese, and by the way, one third of us are, one third of the population in the U.S. has a biomass of over 30. And if you uh, look at the comorbidity, the correlation between obesity and sleep apnea, or type 2 diabetes, or hypertension, it's really high. And these are preventable. The problem is it's very, very hard to get people to modify their behavior. And so there are new technologies, all using data, like telehealth, which is virtual care, and virtual patient coaching, meaning you can actually do this over a smartphone and have a regular coach who can help you lead you through this behavior modification. And it's actually happening. We've got sensors today. I joined Silicon Valley in the early days of the microprocessor, Moore's Law. They got more and more powerful you know, every two years. And now we're in the early days of sensors. Well, the estimation is there'll be 50 billion wireless connected devices by the early 2020. Well, there are only six and a half billion of us on the planet, so who's connected to what? Well, sensors are actually machine to machine. You know, they are sensing and they're getting better and they're cutting, coming back and connected to the cloud and it's enabling us to get smarter and smarter data and we're able to do predictive analytics. And it is opening up entirely new fields like precision medicine. So, I think about innovation from the context of purpose-driven innovation. It's got to be inspiring. It's got to be passionate for the leaders. It's got to be connected, hopefully, to a noble cause. Now, what's really interesting to me is what's going on with STEM. Science, technology, engineering, math. You know, these are the fundamentals that anyone who wants to be part of the world that's out there, uh, it's not that we all have to be technologists, we don't all have to be engineers, but we sure better be grounded in some of these basic sciences and understand them because everything that we will be doing in our world is going to be enabled by the rapid changes in these technologies because these technologies are growing at exponential rates, not just one technology, but cloud, mobility, data analytics, sensors, these things are growing at incredible rates of change. Now, Steve Jobs <coughs> loved technology, but he actually loved design more than he loved technology. And he used to say, we've got to find the poetry in technology. And th what he meant by that was that there needs to be a balance between uh, science, technology, engineering, and math with the liberal arts. And the great balance for us at Apple was always design. You know, we thought of design from the perspective of, you know, you make technology beautiful, 
or you make it invisible. And so Steve was not actually an engineer, uh, but he was technically proficient and he had the genius ability to be able to see where the world was going and what ways that technology could actually change our lives. He used to call it, we're going to build bicycles for the mind. We're going to focus on the non-technical people who would never use computers before, and we're going to give them creative tools. So he was interested in finding this balance between technology and the liberal arts. And I believe that the opportunities for future moonshots is just going to be extraordinary. For example, think about the opportunities to change education, the opportunities to uh, change Earth surface science involving the climate, the opportunities to look for new energy sources that are alternatives to fossil fuels. You know, ironically, all of these things can be traced back to data and data analytics. So it's an amazing time to find your own noble cause. It's an amazing time to have a curiosity about the world to think about what do you want to do with your life? And what you'll discover is that you don't have to have a clear plan when you leave school. You just need to go out and try things. And maybe the first thing you do isn't going to be the thing you're going to end up doing for the rest of your life. But everything that you do will become part of the foundations of the context for things that you'll do after that. So I encourage you to have a curiosity. We live in the era where learning is not about memorizing the answers. Learning is about understanding what are the right questions. And the ability to be curious, to ask questions, to get your hands dirty and trying things out, to don't worry about making mistakes, these are the things that will enable you to have the tools for the mind to be able to search and hopefully find your own noble cause and to hopefully be a part of a focus on how do I build purpose-driven innovation. Thank you.